When our houses are not warm enough, we adjust the valve on the radiator. When we start to melt like ice cream, we set the right temperature on the remote control for the AC. But who regulates the temperature in our home? I mean our common home, the Earth. Before your choice falls between man, the cosmos and a higher power, let's look at how the temperature of the Earth is measured scientifically. There is a huge yellow, though it's actually white, radioactive microwave dwelling in space. The Sun is radioactive in the sense that it sends shortwave radiation to the surface of the Earth. Half of it is absorbed by the surface itself and half of it is sent back into space. Well, that's if we put it crudely. In fact, it is more complicated than that. The solar energy is partly reflected from clouds and the atmosphere, partly from the surface and partly absorbed by the atmosphere. But we're not climatologists and we will allow ourselves a little simplification. Because for us, laymen, the second part about the radioactivity of the Earth is more important. Yes, it turns out the Earth is emitting long-wave radiation into space. And here is the main trick. As any system strives for balance, our Sun, Earth, Earth, Space, Energy Exchange system balances out and temperatures stabilize. And that all would be easy, but above the surface of the Earth, there is an atmosphere with greenhouse gases that make adjustments. So, while the sun rays penetrate the atmosphere without any problem, the long wavelengths from the Earth get stuck in it. Our atmosphere is semi-transparent to the radiation from the Earth, and since this energy is trapped there, the atmosphere itself heats up, sending radiation in all directions, into space and to the Earth. It turns out the system comes to an equilibrium, taking into account three elements now – the Sun, the Earth and the layer of greenhouse gases. Thanks to the latter, the equilibrium is reached at a higher temperature than it would without the atmosphere. And then there is the question, do you think the greenhouse effect is good for our planet at all or not? Now, look, we currently have an average temperature of 14.9 degrees Celsius on Earth. By the way, 2020 was one of the warmest years in the history of observation. Other records happened recently in 2016 and 2019. Once again, this is an average number. Don't judge solely on what you see outside your window. Now, if there was no greenhouse effect, the average temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius, so the Earth would be 33 degrees colder. And now you can look out your window and subtract 33 degrees. Most likely you would see deadly Siberia or even Oymyakon outside your window. Although, it's not like we would even have the opportunity to look out the window. Well, it's not like we would exist at all in such a case. And this vital for us warming of the Earth is made possible by greenhouse gases. These are the most important ones. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane and ozone. Many people out of habit think that climate scientists only pay attention to CO2, when the most important greenhouse gas is water vapor, that is, ordinary water. It comes in the highest volume among other greenhouse gases up there. And methane, for example, has a global warming potential 25 times greater than carbon dioxide. But there are two buts. Water vapor will not rise in the atmosphere by itself. It is a guided gas, a consequence gas of other events, falling back to Earth as a result of rainfall and fog. The concentration of methane is extremely low. And here is carbon dioxide that has brought out all the best. It is the leading gas, and there are many sources that can increase its concentration. And exactly this growth of CO2 heats up our planet, so that global hysteria appears. 120 presidents meet in Glasgow, 16-year-olds speak at the UN, blah, blah, blah. and an electric car manufacturer that has yet to make a single sale overtakes Volkswagen in terms of capitalization and becomes number three. But how can we really know that the planet is heating up?
When we made the video about the UN report, we showed this graph with the change in the temperature of the Earth. Since 1850, it has gone up by 1.1 degrees, and I reckon it immediately begs a question. So you're saying that meteorologists existed 200 years ago, did they? As a matter of fact, yes, and even earlier. One of the very first meteorological stations dates back to 1654 in Florence. They even measured the hottest day back then. Here in Russia, thanks to Peter the Great, systematic weather observations began in 1722. So, should we be surprised that we have temperature data from 1850? These are simply instrumental observations recorded at a weather station. Yes, but in that video, you also showed the temperature that was 6,500 years ago, which was the hottest in 100,000 years. Were they measuring temperature at weather stations back then as well? This is where paleoclimatology comes in. This science studies the climate of the past. And for example, what in our eyes is a lifeless mountain of snow is actually a Klondike for researchers and scientists. Have you ever wondered what people have forgotten on these polar expeditions? What can be found in the snowy desert? Well, this cylindrical ice thingy. It's called a core sample. They drill it out of the ice in Antarctica. And different parts of this ice block contain literal imprints of past climatic conditions. The closer to the surface, the more recent. But the deeper parts may contain climate data from thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago. Scientists can analyze the structure of the crystal lattice, the concentration of particles and, most importantly, the air bubbles frozen and preserved in time. These are millennia-old samples of air from the past. Scientists can therefore determine how climatic conditions changed and what the temperature was back then. And here's just one of many examples from the Nature Journal of 1999. Scientists decomposed one such ice block and got a history of climate change over the last a little more than 420,000 years. And they simply observed a correlation that as CO2 concentrations rise, the Earth gets warmer and vice versa, less carbon dioxide, the planet gets colder. Now, pay attention. Over the last 400,000 years, the concentration of CO2 has gone from 180 particles per million to 280 particles per million. Just so you know, it's 0.18% and 0.28% respectively. It's just easier to say the first way. But for the last 200 years, we have been updating records very rapidly and have reached 417 particles per million. And mind you, you see an exponential graph, which means it takes less and less time to reach new heights. I mean, even during the industrial era, it took 140 years to increase the CO2 concentration by 20 particles per million. And now we have such an increase in 12 years. How many times faster is that? And I'm not even talking about how slowly conditions had been changing thousands of years ago. But was there ever a period on Earth when there was as much CO2 in the atmosphere as it is now? Because, you know, there are theories that everything in nature is cyclical, and we're just entering one of those cycles. Yes, as a matter of fact, there was. But a long time ago, not many of you remember that time, the Miocene Epoch. That's about 20 million years ago. Don't forget to thank the frozen air bubbles for this data. At that fine time, horses and camels roamed the tundra, and seas were 10 meters higher, which would now flood a whole bunch of towns and hundreds of millions of people right with them. Wait, wait, wait. If camels used to roam the tundra when there was less CO2 and such a thing isn't happening right now, then what's the big deal? The fact is that the climate system is slightly more complex than some Excel formula, where when you multiply a cell by two, you immediately get the result. 
We have drastically changed CO2 levels and certain processes have already been set in motion that will make us closer to the Miocene in a hundred years. The Earth's climate is a huge, complex object, modelled on supercomputers to then result with a simple graph like the one in the UN Commission report. Let's remember another graph with tons of the hard work of modelling complex systems behind it, which answers who is to blame for all this. Scientists have also modelled how global warming would have played out without people, using only the sun and those giant volcanoes as affecting factors. As you can see, it wouldn't happen at all. Previously, we didn't show yet another simply stunning page of the report. In theory, our planet should have warmed not by 1.1 degrees, but by 1.5 degrees by now. Scientists took everything into account. Carbon dioxide, methane, other greenhouse gases, and even the condensation trail from planes. And all that must have warmed the Earth by one and a half degrees. By the way, as you can see, the influence of volcanoes and the sun is estimated to be about zero. But we also produce aerosols like sulfur oxide that cool the atmosphere. So it turns out that mankind has heated the planet by 1.5 degrees, cooled it by 0.4 degrees, and now we have 1.1. The balance has been disturbed thanks to the CO2 skewness. And this skewness has occurred at an incredible rate. The climate of the Miocene epoch had been forming for millions of years, and we've been in a stable cycle of 180 to 280 particles per million for 400, no, 800,000 years to be exact. And in just 200 years, we have broken the record and return to the Miocene in terms of CO2 levels. The rest is silence. Some might say, Well, there was a time on Earth when there was many times more carbon dioxide. Yeah, except it was 50 million years ago and the Arctic was inhabited by alligators. Well, firstly, do you want it to be like the Cenozoic? And secondly, those processes that used to take tens of millions of years can already happen in hundreds of years. Here's another example, an enlarged picture of CO2 rising by 80 particles per million over 22,000 years. Well, it only took us about 60 years. Here's the thing, it's not just the rise in temperature, it's the high rate of its growth. We have to make a distinction between the natural and enhanced greenhouse effect. The first one is simply essential for us to live on the Earth, while the latter is a skewness in the heat balance that man has created via CO2. Moreover, it's not just about global warming. Yes, everything heats up on average and it heats up differently, but that is not humanity's main problem at the moment. After all, landscapes, habitats, and our lives will change. On TV, they talk about global warming, but scientists use another, more correct term. Global climate change. And to make it generally clear to everyone, global environmental change is coming. Which, if you want a video, we'll tell you about next time. It's about the extinction of the ice giants, the changing pH balance of the ocean, and the slowing of the Gulf Stream. By the way, here in Russia we have a scientist, Alexei Yakayakin. He talks great about global climate change. We can say that this episode was based on his lecture. Cheers to him! Now, I hope you understand a bit better how this dreaded global climate change works. Leave a like, subscribe, hit the bell, and share this video with your acquainted skeptics. And don't forget to check out our Patreon. And I'm The Researcher.